the fold, right? So we've eaten natural food. We have had communion one with another. We've worshipped. And so now we're going to eat a little of the Word of God. How many know that, and this is something that science has just recently found out, how many of you know, maybe you could turn me up just a hair yet, just a hair yet. How many of you know that science has recently discovered that you have an immortal gene in your body? Yeah. Now, everybody has this, and they say that that immortal gene is in every person, every man, woman, boy, and girl, but they say that it's lying dormant. And let me just tell you how you can resurrect that or cause that immortal gene to come alive, to be quickened within your physical body and the cells of your body. Yeah. It's already there, but you can experience it and walk in it through the knowing and the awareness that we've been talking about. Scripture says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, the truth doesn't make you free, but the knowing of the truth in the awareness is what makes us free. So you see, you know, I did a series of teachings, I don't know, maybe at least two years ago, that I entitled The Awareness Factor. How many remember? And I was researching some stuff, and I just want to tell you, of every message that I have ministered in nearly 40 years, that one was the clincher for me. Because what I taught in that series was that the Word of God appeals to our awareness. It's not appealing to changing an identity. It's not appealing to changing a sinful nature. But the Word of God is appealing to our awareness to show us who we have always been. Now, from before the foundation, we were upright, we were righteous, we were holy, we were one. We were never separate from Him. And so the most important thing we can get from the Word of God, and I say the Word of God here, but I'm talking about the Word that's already written within our heart, and we go to this to confirm it, the most important word that we can get is the word that will appeal to our awareness and cause us to become awakened to who we have always been. Who he has always been, not just in us, but as us in the earth. Now, we've been doing a series of teachings in this series on mind-brain connections. We've been in Exodus a little while, and then we started a couple of weeks ago, and there's already one up on YouTube, the first one. And uh, we have a couple of live streams that are on my Facebook page where we dealt with Exodus. But specifically, we went into what I am calling the Cosmic Big Ten. <laughs> the Cosmic Big Ten, meaning what? You see, God never gave us the law. The law was given to the Jewish people. God never wanted us to have our lives led by rules on rocks. That was never God's intention for us to be directed and led by external rules that were written upon rocks. And, you know, you, someone might say, well, you know, didn't uh, God with the finger, his finger write, you know, the Ten Commandments on the stones? Do you know that uh, it has been proven that that should never have been put in the Bible that way? Hello? You know, where it says the finger of God, you know, wrote on the rocks or wrote on the tablets of stone? See, and in Jeremiah, it specifically says, God said through Jeremiah, I never spoke to your fathers when they were, you know, in Egypt to have blood sacrifices. I never wanted that. I never spoke to them to kill animals. Can you imagine a God that can't forgive you unless he kills somebody? Now, that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. But yet we taught it that way in penal substitution. Now, that's not my message. We're going to talk about the Cosmic Big Ten tonight. And what I want us to see is that everything that is in, written in us and everything that's written in the scriptures is, and I know some people have a problem with this, is allegorical. Someone says, well, there's some things that are literal. There are some things that manifest in a literal sense, but when the scripture talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the spirit, if you read the whole context in Galatians there, you'll find out that it's talking primarily about an awareness, and a certain awareness can cause us to... Exp 
express the works of the flesh or express the fruit of the Spirit. It has to do with the awareness. Jesus said it this way. It's not that which is without that defiles the man, but that which is within that defiles the man. In other words, if your awareness is corrupt, see, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, or so is his experience. So it's not demons and devils and people and things out here that defile the man, but it is that which is within that defiles the man. In other words, the awareness that you take on. Whether you're thinking out of the left hemisphere of the carnal thoughts or whether you're thinking out of the mind of Christ and exercising the signal eye. Now, that was just your appetizer. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 20 and let's look at ex Exodus chapter 20 as we continue. And I'm going to reiterate some of the things that I shared on the first of the cosmic Big Ten. And remember I shared with you how that the Hindus say, or they acknowledge multitudes of gods. The Buddhists say there is no God. New Age says we're God. And the Muslims say God is one who is all-powerful, but he's unknowable. But you know what? All of them are wrong. All of them are wrong. Because I've not told anyone that you're God. But God has chosen to express himself as us. But we don't go around telling people, well, we're God. We don't go around telling people that. Now, what I want to do is balance that out and show you the balance of that concerning what Jesus had to say. So let me just go back and just kind of reiterate for those who were not here or maybe those who did not see it through YouTube or our live stream. I want to go back and I want to just talk about the first and then we're going to do probably about three of the cosmic big ten or the commandments as people call them. Now remember, you can get anything, anything out of the word of God and the law was not given to us, but we're looking at the ten commandments so-called allegorically. And if we can see the algorithm or the allegoricalness of the ten commandments, you see that's not putting you under law. What it is doing is bringing it to the inside because, listen, Jesus fulfilled the law. Hello? Not by doing it in an external sense. Because how many know he picked corn and he healed people? And that was a no-no for the Jewish people under the law. Neither did he keep the 613 laws that man added to the Ten Commandments. But he walked in love, therefore he fulfilled them. Now listen, not still not in an external sense. Right. Because he healed on the Sabbath, he picked corn on the Sabbath, but he fulfilled them in an allegorical sense, which is what we're looking at here as we look at the cosmic Big Ten. So let's read here to begin with in Exodus 20 and verse 3. The first allegorical cosmic of the Big Ten says, Thou shalt have no other gods, notice, before me. Now we concluded that the I, the name of God is what I. Remember when Moses went on Mount Horeb and he said, God, who shall I tell them, you know, sent me to deliver them out of Egyptian bondage? He said, tell them I am, Y-H-W-H, I am sent you. So one of the names of God is I. And then the last part of this where it says, thou shalt have no other gods before me, Another name of God is me. And remember, I asked you the question, who is the president of the United States? And no one knew. And I said, his name is Donnie. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Donnie Trump. <laughs> so if I would ask you, who are you? Or excuse me, who is God? Would you have the nerve to say I am? Me? Because there's an aspect of you that is one with the I am and with the me that he's talking about. Now, let me have you quickly go, go to John chapter 5 and verse 30. John chapter 5, because we looked at Jesus and we saw how the religion has taught people to ask Jesus for this, for that, and the other. How many of you have ever asked Jesus for something? And we teach our kids, if you want a little red wagon, go ask Jesus. And Jesus will bring it to you. Well, can I declare to you tonight? He won't. Because he said, I can do nothing. Don't ask me anything. Come on. I can do nothing. And that's what it says here in John.
on 539. I know we've been through all of this already, but I just want to reiterate this first of the Big Ten, thou shalt have no other gods before me. So notice in John 530, Jesus is speaking here, and he states, I of my own self can do nothing. What is he doing? He's putting a disclaimer alongside of his name. He's putting a disclaimer alongside of his name. So we have all these people asking Jesus to heal us and Jesus to bring us this and Jesus to bring us that. He says, I can't do nothing. I can't do anything. I can do nothing. I in and of myself can do absolutely no thing. Take it a little bit further. Go to John chapter 5 and verse 30. And I want to read this out of the King James and then I want to read it out of the Mirror Bible. And by the way, I was really honored by the Mirror Bible. Because my name's in it. <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, the guy was listening, the guy that wrote this, Francois, was listening to our series of teachings in the book of Revelation on YouTube. And so he quotes me in the book of Revelation. And I thought, I was so humbled, I was bawling around the house when I found out that he, he in fact, he sent me a personal uh, private message through Facebook and he said, I just wanted to let you know that I quoted you in the Mirror Bible. And I thought, oh wow, what an honor to be quoted in the Mirror Bible. But uh, look what it says here in John 5 and verse 30. In John 5 and verse 30, he said, I of myself can do nothing. Yet we ask Jesus for stuff all the time. Don't you see people on Facebook ask, pray to Jesus that so-and-so gets healed, or, or pray to Jesus that this happens or that happens or the other happens, right? We see it all the time. And he said, I of myself can do nothing. I of myself can do nothing. And then verse 31, if I bear witness in myself, my witness is not true. In other words, if I tell you I can, I'm lying. That's what that's saying. I can do nothing in and of myself. And if I bear witness of myself and tell you I can, I'm lying. Well, there you go. Now listen to what the uh, Mirror Bible says in verse 30. The dynamic of my doing is in my union with my Father. The dynamic of my doing is in union with my Father. My intimate acquaintance with His voice. Listen to that. My intimate acquaintance with His voice is what inspires me. As I hear, I discern, and my judgment is just. As I hear from the Father, I discern, and my judgment is just or righteous. There is no conflicting interest here. My Father's commission, my Father's commission is my commission or my mission in life. So I can do nothing, and if I tell you I can, I'm lying. That's what he said there in John 5, 30 and 31. Now look at John chapter 8 and verses 18 and 19. John chapter 8, you're right there, verses 18 and 19. And it says, I am one that bear witness of myself, and the Father that sent me beareth witness of me. Then said they unto him, Where is thy Father? Listen to this. Jesus answered, Ye neither know me or my Father. If ye had known me, you should have known my Father also. So what was Jesus referring to? I mean, obviously he couldn't have been talking about himself because in John 5, he just got done saying, I can do nothing of myself. And he also said, if I tell you I can, I'm lying. Yeah. So what is Jesus talking about here? He's talking about the me of thee. He's talking about the, the I am of you and I. That's what he's talking about. You know, if a doctor would cut you open, they could not find your thoughts. They could not find the Christ. They could not find the me. They could not find the me that is the mystical Christ. They could not find that within us. So what is that referring to? It's simply referring, look at John 10 and verse 30. Look at verse, uh, uh, John 10 and verse 30. What is it talking about? It's talking about the invisible realm of the Christ that is who we be in our union with the Father. That's what it's talking about. Jesus, he, he acknowledged that he could do nothing. Only as he saw the Father do could he do. Only as he heard the Father speak could he speak. Only that 
God is the only way he could perform the miracles that he did in his earthly ministry because he only did what he saw the Father do, only spoke what he heard the Father say. You see, that was the I am, but in and of himself he could do nothing. But the I am could do all things, and you and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Now let's keep going here. Look what he says in John 10 and verse 30. I and my Father are one. Listen, not I, Jesus. <laughs> not I, Jesus, because I can't do anything by myself. Come on. See, listen, Jesus did not, in fact, he admonished us not to pray to him. He did. Hello? Come on. Not to pray to Jesus, yeah. but to believe that there was something in him, as him, and listen, it's the same thing in you and in me. Amen. Jesus looked at his disciples one day and he said, it's better for you, it's expedient for you that I go away. Otherwise, you're never going to turn to the withinness. There it is. You're never going to turn to the I amness. You're never going to turn to the me of thee unless I go away. In fact, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he tells us we're to know no man after the flesh. And then it says, and neither shall you know, and it says Christ, and it should have been Jesus, neither shall you know Jesus after the flesh. Jesus never wanted us to worship him, folks. He didn't. No, he didn't. He never wanted us to worship him. He wanted us to follow him. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Because there's a difference between worshiping Jesus and following him. Now, look at John chapter 12. And verse 26. I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because I want to get to the second of the Cosmic Big Ten. And I know this is just repetition here. But John 12 and verse 26. John 12, 26. And he says, if any man, listen to this, serve me. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now, back when we read that first Cosmic Big Ten, have no other gods before me, what is that me talking about? It's talking about the same part of us that is the I am. So let me read this again, John 12, 26. If any man serve me, <clears throat> let him follow me. He doesn't want us to worship him. Jesus didn't ever say he wanted us to worship him. He wants us to follow him. Let him follow me. But what me is it talking about? It's talking about the me of thee. It's talking about the I am that is within you, that you've always been one with. See? So he says again, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. So he's talking about the me. He's not, he obviously is not talking about the Jesus that said I can do nothing. Amen. He's obviously not talking about the Jesus part that said, if I tell you I can, don't believe me, I'm lying. Yeah. He's not talking about that part, that part. Now listen, someone says, well that sounds like duality. You're saying a part of us? I, in and of myself, can do nothing? You know what the I is? The I, where we are concerned, is that false sense of knowledge that false sense of separation, that false sense of ego, that false sense of I in an outer external sense. But you know what? You are not that being. And Jesus recognized that that was not his true identity, and that's why he always turned within. And that's what he's wanting us to do. He's wanting us not to think we're God. He's wanting us in and of ourselves, we're not God, but he's wanting us to realize that there is the real, see, there's only one life, folks. And the one life we have is the life of the I am and the life of me. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It's the life of that consciousness of Christ, that mystic Christ, if I can say it that way, that part that if they cut you open, they would not find Christ. See, now that brings, listen, folks, that brings the balance because of, you know, the way the New Age people say, I'm God, I'm God. No, you're not. Yeah. But there's one in you as you that yes. is God, yeah. that is the Father, that is the mystical Christ. And that's the understanding that we, we need to have. So let's get to the point here so we can understand what this is conveying to us. I am is God. The Father, listen, is Christ consciousness. 
The Father was the I am in Jesus that did the works. The Father was the, the me consciousness, the me of Christ consciousness that said what he said because he heard the Father say it, that did what he did because he saw the Father do it. So as we read in Exodus 20 and verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, this is vitally important because we have all kinds of religions that say this is God and that is God, God here, God there, everywhere, God, God. Right? There are religions that say that. They believe, listen, that God is sovereign and he controls everything that happens in this world. Can I tell you that's a false teaching? Can I tell you that is not true? true? Why would he tell us? Why would he say in Genesis that I've made you in my image after my likeness? I've blessed you and I've said have dominion. Yes. What are we to have dominion for? Yes. <laughs> what are we to have dominion for if God is sovereign in the sense that some have taught the sovereignty of God and he's in control of everything? Then why would he give us dominion? Why would our awareness matter? Why would he say, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he? And how that out of this left hemisphere and what that represents, we can bring some hellish things into our... And let, let me go this far and say, the left side is hell. Yeah. <laughs> the left side can be hell to you. Now, yes, God gave that because he wanted us, he wanted to give us a, 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 an option. He wanted to give us an option so that we can choose to either live in heaven or live in hell. And I shared with you before, we were not born in Egypt. We were born in heaven. Yes. We were born in heaven. We came here as yes. heavenly creatures, you see. And that's what it means to be born again. Do you know there's a difference between the word salvation and born again? We'll talk about that more later. But salvation is it's deliverance, it's healing, it's health, it's preservation, and so forth. Born again, which I'm going to show you with the scripture a little later on. Born again is simply remembering your origin. <laughs> That's born again, just remembering your origin. Now, go back to Exodus chapter 20. I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. That's about all the repeat that I'm going to give you. Just a little more, not much. So it's I, it's me. Now, what happens when a person dies physically? Who leaves? The body goes to the dust. Who leaves? The I, yes, the me, the Christ. See, that makes it real simple. The real you, you see, the body turns back to the dust. You croak, and that's the end of that part of you. The I that can do nothing, you see. You see. Now, look what it says in Exodus chapter 20, verses 4 and 5. As we take this a little bit further, now look what it says here. Thou shalt... Now, this is actually uh, the second one, the second so-called commandment or the cosmic big ten. Thou shalt, I'm just going to give you a little bit on this because it's very understandable. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven, now let me add a word, because graven means a man-made image. This is number two now. The first one was, you'll have no other gods before me, okay? And this one is now, you shall not make unto thee any man-made image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. Now, let me tell you what the graven image is. Sickness has a power. Disease has a power. And so what I have to do is get a greater power to overcome what I consider to be a lesser power. That's a man-made image. That's a graven image. That's a man-made, listen, that is a man-made doctrine that religion has purported and taught and caused us to believe, and we embraced. It could be a Baptist doctrine. It could be a Pentecostal doctrine. It could be an Episcopalian. It could be Catholic. It could be... New Life Ministries, it could, be, it could be anything that we have erroneously embraced, erroneously taken into ourselves. That is making a graven image. That's right. See, that's the allegorical. Now, to them it was literal to the Jewish people, but to us the allegorical aspect of not making any graven image before us and bringing it before us would be all of our squirrely stuff we have believed. There's more than one power, there's more than one presence, you know, all of that that we learn. And listen, there's over, they say there's over 40 denominations in the world today. Think of all the graven images, the false concepts 
that they have designed and invented. See, that's why the scripture says that when he brought us here, he brought us here upright, and we sought out many inventions or schemes, and the biggest scheme, the biggest invention that religion has come up with is we came here with an Adamic identity and a sinful nature, yeah. rather than coming here upright. So that's a graven image that we have put before us. And the whole world is full of all of, the whole church world, yeah. religiously, is full of all of these graven images. Sure. Now, let's read on here, because let me give you something that I really want us to see. And again, we have gone through this before. But look what it says. I think it's verse 5. It says there, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Now listen to this next word. Visiting. The iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and the fourth generation of them that hate me. Now the word visiting there, listen very carefully, the word visiting is a reflexive verb. It's like when Jesus was led of the Spirit into the wilderness and it says the devil tempted him. That was a reflexive pronoun. There was no devil out here. It was that the temptation came from within him. Think about it. He had fasted for 40 days. Don't you think the guy was hungry? After the 40 days, and they say after 40 days of fasting, you know, starvation can set in if you don't eat. So it wasn't some entity out here. The devil is a reflexive pronoun, and a reflexive pronoun speaks of, it brings it into yourself. And so this word visiting here, listen, is a reflexive verb, and what it's talking about is you and I. We visit the iniquities of the fathers down to the third and the fourth generation. Yeah. If we don't stop the cycle, yeah. not the disciple, the cycle of religiosity. Yes, I think I ain't too much tonight. Yes, See, so we're the ones that need to break the cycle yeah. of all of this squirmy teaching that we have received yeah. in religiosity so that it no longer goes down to the third and the fourth generation. Right. So that our kids and our grandchildren yes. and our great grandchildren can hear the truth and experience this immortal gene that science says that we all have. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a little bit lit tonight. But I'll tell you what, I'm in rare form tonight. I was so excited about getting here tonight, fellowshipping with all of you, and bringing this word forth. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. So the religious idea, this religious idea of opening our minds up to the graven images that religious idea has got to go. So we no longer pass it on down. It's just going to keep on going down from generation to generation. So you see, what we have to do is we have to, what do we have to do? We have to focus upon the mind of Christ. Slip in like you slip into a garment. It's so easy. It's easy to slip into your garment, right? So when an appearance realm of something looms up before you, what do you need to do? Instead of reacting, you need to respond. Stop dead in your tracks for a, just takes a second or two. Stop dead in your tracks and acknowledge the mind of Christ and operate or exercise out of the single eye. What does it mean to operate or exercise out of the single eye? Look at it not from the left hemisphere, not from the natural, not from your natural reasoning or your natural intellect, but look at it through the mind of Christ and only see one. You know, the scripture says that to God, the darkness and the light are alike. What does that mean? God doesn't see a pair of opposites. We see sick, well, rich, poor, right, wrong, mortal, immortal. We see that. No, just see one single eye. Just see one. Just see one. Yeah. When something looms up before you like a sickness or symptoms, just see one and realize that symptom has no stinking power whatsoever. And if you give it, if you think it has power, you're giving it a power that it doesn't have. Because listen, I've said this for years, nothing in and of itself has any power except the power we give it by believing that it has a power. Yes. You see? So the whole key is operating, slipping into this mind of Christ, exercising the single eye. Now, let me have you go, hang on to Exodus 20 and go back to John 5 and verse 19. John chapter 5 and verse 19. Our focus has got to be the internal, not the external. The internal, not the external. So disease, whether it be disease or fear or condemnation or... Listen, do you know why we have war out there? 
Listen, if you have war in your mind, you have war in your home. Yeah. If people, if the majority of the people in the world, yeah. and they do, have war, they're thinking war in their mind, that's why we have war out there. Yeah. Right. You know what it is? It is the vibrational, yeah. the corporate, universal yeah. yes. vibration mm -hmm. that yes. the world is releasing yeah. out there by the way they think, yeah. and it's what causes our wars, yeah. tsunamis, tornadoes, all kind of devastation. Yeah. It's because of the universal vibration, right. the thoughts that are in the mind. And listen, I think most of it is coming from the religious people. Yeah. Yeah. The great majority of it is coming from the religious people, yeah. and they blame God, and they say, well, God is sovereign. What will yeah. be, will be, case of or uh, whatever. We'll, we can't stop it. We can't do anything. In fact, I went into Tim Hortons yesterday. Sorry, I forgot to tell you. Yeah. <laughs> forgot to invite you. Yeah, and I, I went in there, and one of my old school friends that I go out, you know, a couple times a year with and have breakfast with her, her and her husband were in there. And he said, sit down with us. And we began to talk just a little bit. And then he started going into what his preacher's preaching. Uh, uh, I thought, shut your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, to myself. Um, to myself. <laughs> <laughs> to myself. Kate Fairchild just shut your mouth. You don't say one stinking word. And I didn't. I just listened to him. I just smiled. <laughs> he said, you know, my preacher, he's not focusing on hellfire and brimstone. But what he's focusing on, and he has this big screen, and he puts all the scriptures you know, on the wall, and he explains them so nice, anyone could understand them. And what he's teaching is current events. What's happening in the world, and how the scriptures are all lining up. Do you know, can I tell you, and you know, there's what is called audience relevance. We need to understand that a lot of this was talking to the Jewish people. Now can we gain, it's, it was to them, but for us, because there's something that we can gain out of that as well, it's to them, but for us. And so he's taking all of these things that were, you know, were, are in the scriptures that are really for the Jewish people, and he's making like, for example, 70 AD would happen in Matthew 24 as something that's going to come in our future. And they thought that was wonderful. And then he said, then here's the clincher. Then he said, well, you know that God is sovereign. God is sovereign. God is in control of everything, and no matter what happens, God is sovereign. Good thing you didn't fight me. <laughs> can you see? Yes. Can you see? Can you see why I didn't open my mouth? Oh. They're my friends. <laughs> They're my friends, they're my school buddies, and my friends, and, and, but you know what, I really believe the day is going to come. And then one time, this has probably been two or three years ago, I was out to breakfast with her, and she said, you know, uh, we're going to come to your meeting in Fort Wayne sometime. And I didn't say a word. <laughs> I thought, oh, please don't. <laughs> please don't. You'll tar and feather me for sure, and I'll no longer be your friend. You know, now, you know. When the door opens, yes. When the door opens to say, I'll say it. But up to this point, I haven't been led. That's right. You know, we don't need to say everything we know. We don't need to say. We don't need to set everyone straight. Because listen, every man's going to come in his own order. If we're led by the Spirit, yes, we can spout out some stuff to them. But I honestly wasn't led of the Spirit to say a word. But I know the day's probably going to come when I'll be able to share some things with them. Now, John chapter 5, verse 19. Let me read this. See, we even have people today that say, Jesus is Lord, and, you know, they have bumper stickles, uh, stickers on their car. Honk if you love Jesus. Or, honk if, you know, Jesus is Lord. Do you ever honk? <laughs> I used to honk. <laughs> I remember a time I used to honk, Jesus is Lord, or, or Jesus this, or Jesus. I used to. I used to once in a while. But listen, Jesus in and of himself is not Lord, but it's the Christ consciousness of the Father that is Lord. Yes, through him in what he did. But listen, we must, I know this is tight, but it's right. we got to quit singing songs about Jesus. <laughs> oh, I know. Uh, that's just really getting under some people's skin. But listen, he came to reveal the Father. He came to reveal. That's why he told the disciples, it's better for you that I go away or you're never going to turn with him. He even said, you're going to do greater things than I because I'm going to leave. How are we going to do these greater things? Yeah. The Christ consciousness. And listen, I'll tell you what I believe it is. The greater things are not going around 
necessarily laying hands on people. Not that we don't ever do this, but it's not going around healing people. It is teaching them a word that will cause them to draw out of their own I amness and their own asness and their own isness and their own meanness. M E dash M E S S, not meanness. Meanness. And draw out of that. And then the fruit that comes is fruit that remains. It's not a healing or this or that that's here today and gone tomorrow. Because we can have the best healing ministry come and lay hands on us and we can get healed instantly and lose it next week. Or right. down the road get another disease or, or end up croaking down the road, you know, 10 years later. So I'm about getting fruit that remains. I'm about teaching people how they can draw out of their own well. Yes. Not depend on me. Yes. I'm here to give you back your life. You know, not trying to keep you under my thumb and tell you how you can't do it. You have to have a priest or a pastor or a pope or a popo. <laughs> <laughs> and they'll lay hands on you and maybe get you delivered. You know, but listen, we, listen, folks, we must move. We must move beyond that. And we must learn how to draw out of our own well and experience that fruit that remains. Now look what it says here. Let me get to this. John 5, 19. Verily, verily, truly, truly. I say unto you, uh, when you see truly, truly, or verily, verily, that means pay attention to this. Truly, truly, I say unto you, verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. So everybody says, Jesus is Lord. He said, I can do nothing. Jesus is Lord, I can't do nothing. Don't ask, one scripture says, don't ask me for anything. And what are we doing? Asking Jesus to come into our heart. We don't need to ask Jesus to come into our heart. He already came, we already came into his. Yes. <laughs> he asked us to come into his. Yes. We've always been in his heart. Yeah. So you gotta walk the green mile. Now listen, let me, let me just balance that out by saying we all probably came that way. Walking the green mile, confessing our sins, saying the sinner's prayer and all of that. Yeah. But you know what it really was? No one should doubt their salvation if they did that. I came that way as well. But you know what it really was? It was the discovery of something that was already true, but I just did not know it or understand it. That's what it was. It was the discovery of what was already true about me. Then verse 30 of John 5, we read it before. I can of my own self do nothing. And then 31 again, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. In other words, if I say I can do this, that, or the other, don't believe it because it's not the truth. Now, look at John 8, 28. John 8, 28. Again, I just want to kind of reiterate this. Then Jesus said unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father hath taught me, I speak these things. So now let me ask you, who is the Son of Man? Now be careful before you answer. Mm -hmm. Who is the Son of Man? You. Yep. And what he's saying here is, if you will meditate and raise up your consciousness, then the I am, the me, that he talked about in Exodus chapter 20, Verse 3, the me and the I am will be lifted up. Wow. That's what he's talking about. When you lift up the Son of Man, that's talking about lifting up the consciousness. Wow. Yeah, and here we have Emmanuel's whiz bag coming to town, and he's, you know, saying, come to the altar. Come, and he said, Jesus, into your heart. Yeah. Huh? It's totally off base, folks. Yeah. All of that's totally off base. Brother Whisbang doesn't know anything about experiencing salvation, making you walk the green mile and accept it. Do you know that the sinner's prayer is nowhere to be found in the scriptures? <laughs> it's nowhere to be found in the scriptures. Now let me give you another one. Go to John 16, John 16 and verse 23. We were told to ask Jesus to come into our heart, right? Right. Evangelist Wisbane came to town and says, you've got to ask Jesus into your heart. Oh but look what it says here. Look what it says here in John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Wow. <laughs> in that day you shall ask me nothing. Yeah. Oh, but you've got to ask Jesus into your heart. Wow. <laughs> ask me nothing. Listen, barely, barely, I say unto you, 
whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Someone says, I got you, Sister Kay, because it says, whatever you ask the Father in my name, I'll give it to you. Well, let me just tell you what this is really talking about. The word name, let me just say this. I was given a dictionary. Lorraine uh, Williams, that used to come here, she had a flood in her basement, and she had this mis mystical, uh, mystical dictionary that uh, was almost destroyed in her flood, in, the, in the, the basement flood that they had. She said, would you like to have this book? It was all wet and musty and smelled horrible. And uh, I said, yeah, I'll take it. And I have received more understanding from that book, once I dried it out and the musty smelling got out of it, I I've received more, and listen, from that book than I have the Strong's Concordance. Wow. And it has some mystical ideas that the ancients of the East believed in. And one of the things I found out, where it says here, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, we have used the name of Jesus as a magical formula. Yeah. All you got to do is ask in the name of Jesus, and we throw that around like a magical form formula. Yeah. But now listen. The word name in mystical language, which, as I said, is more perfect than the Strong's Concordance. Do you know Strong's Concordance has some mistakes? Yeah. <laughs> it really does. Yeah. This word name means way. Way. Oh. Hey. W-A-Y. Hey. So Jesus is saying, if you ask in the way that I tell you, and what is the way? To live out of the mind of Christ. To exercise the single eye. To cast your net to the right side. That's the way. Yeah. To allow it to come from the I am, from the me of thee, from the inside of thee, rather than thinking that you can do something in and of yourself. And that's why Jesus said, I myself can do nothing. So whatever you ask in my name, in the way that I tell you to, which is exercise a single eye, slip into the mind of Christ, or live out of the mind of Sure. Now let me give you another example. Go to Luke chapter 12, 13 and 14. I'm about done with the, the, the review here. And then we'll get into number two of the cosmic big ten. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. Here are these two brothers, or this, this one guy is having a dispute because he didn't get the inheritance that he wanted to get or thought he should get. So he goes to Jesus, and you might be surprised at the response that Jesus gives him. Look what it says there in Luke chapter 12, 13, and 14. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, this is Jesus, Jesus said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? <laughs> call the priest, call the pastor, call the popo, call somebody else, but not me. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, I can't do nothing to solve your problem. Oh my God. And the whole issue, listen, was that Jesus wanted this guy to see that it was all in him. Glory. That it was all within him. And that's why Jesus said, I of myself can do nothing. And if I tell you I can, don't believe me, because he wanted us to turn within to the I am and to the me. Have no other gods before me. That cosmic union, that mystical Christ that you are. He wants us to turn within to that. He wants us to know the truth. John 14, 20 sums it up. That states, at that day ye shall know that I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. I am in you. The me and the Christ. Amen. Now, go back to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, because we haven't had, really we haven't had the revelation of the I am and the me completely. And so what have we done? We've passed on our crazy ideas and our religious concepts from generation to generation. Now look at verse 6. And showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Not an external me, but the me, the I am, within ourselves. Now, let me couple that with the scripture 
if you'll hang on to Exodus, a scripture in Luke 11 and verse 52. Luke 11 and verse 52. Listen to what this says. And I'm going to couple it with what verse 6 says of Exodus chapter 20 that says, Showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Not an external me. Not an external me, but the me within thee. The I am within thee. That one life that you are. So Luke 11, 52 says, Woe to you lawyers. Do we have any lawyers here tonight? Hopefully not. Right? What are lawyers? They're like scribes. They wrote a lot of this. And that's why they got it wrong. Do you know that every translation of the Bible, and that's why I love the Mirror Bible, every translation of the Bible was written with their view in mind. There are some things in the Amplified Bible I absolutely detest, and there's some things I love. And that's why this mirror Bible, as far as I'm concerned, the way it was translated, the way it was written, is up to speed with what we believe today. And you know what? I think it's going to continue to go. People are going to continue to write translations that's going to maybe, maybe even someday you know, exceed this. And I've noticed that Francois has changed some things that he previous, previously wrote. And that's a good thing. That shows that he's awakening more and more. So, so Luke 11, 52 says, Woe to you lawyers, now listen to this, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge. Here's the key of knowledge. Ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in you hindered. So the key of knowledge is entering in yourself, where the I am, where the me is, you see. And so the rippling effect of our entering into ourselves is what changes everything, not only for us, but for future generations. It goes down from generation to generation to generation. Now, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 6 tells us this. Who also hath made us, you and I, able ministers, listen, of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. What is that saying? That's saying when we look at this, we need to get the spiritual, symbolic, parabolic, allegorical truth that this conveys. Because, listen, it's all allegorical. Someone says, aren't there a few things that are literal? No, they play out and manifest in a literal sense, in an outward sense, but it's all allegorical, and that's what we need to see. Psalm 78, 2 says, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old. What are the dark sayings of old? What is the parabolic language? It's, it's not just doing a cursory reading of this Bible and thinking that you have it, but it's seeing beneath the surface. It's seeing by the Spirit. It's seeing the allegorical, symbolic parable. See, Jesus only spoke in parables. Why? Why do you think he only spoke in parables? Because he knew. See, and people take this Bible and they make it about current events. They make it about all of these external yeah. things. They are missing it a million miles. Yeah. You know, talk about end times. End times came and went. Yeah. End times is not in our future. Right. We're living out of the eternal realm of the Father as we live from the inside out. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Isn't that good? Yeah. We need to understand that this is allegorical. You cannot read it on the surface level. Revelation talks about, you know, uh, in Revelation chapter 1, it talks about a book. And in Revelation chapter 5, it talks about the book within the esoteros. What is that? That's the book within us. That's turning within to the book of life within us. In fact, we're called in Revelation a book of life. So you have to turn within. You can't, like I said, you can't read it. And like you read your daily newspaper and you see a horse and that's talking about a horse. Of course. <laughs> so you can't read it that way. You're going to miss it a million miles. Now, go back to Exodus chapter 20. Let's get into the second one now. <laughs> Finally, right? Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7. And this is a big one. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Now, may I report to you tonight, that's not talking about cussing. Taking the name of the Lord in vain is not talking about cursing or cussing or bad language. Now, I'm not insinuating that we use bad language. 
I'm just simply saying that is not what it's talking about. So in verse 7 here where it says we're not to take the name of the Lord the, uh, or not in vain, what is the Lord's name? I am. What? Me. It's the cosmic Christ. And the word vain, listen to this, the word vain means to make of no value. Now let me ask you, who tells you that it is of no value to look within? Who tells you that it is of no value to be involved in, in a religion that says, oh, don't meditate, you're opening yourself up to demons and devils. And that's what they say. That's what religion says, oh, you don't want to meditate. Can't take that meditation stuff, it'll open you up to all kinds of stuff. So what are they doing? They're taking the name, I am me, you see, in vain, they're putting no value on that. And here the Father is saying, the Spirit is saying, I, me, in you, within, you see. When you turn within, you're not taking the name of the Lord in me, but you are highly, you're giving it value. You're recognizing that the I am, that the me, that the Christ consciousness, you're recognizing that and giving it high value. Listen to this, Matthew 15, 3 says, Why do you also transgress the commandment, listen, of God by your tradition? Yeah. Say, traditions of men do not want to show you the true value of turning within. That's too new agey for them. They don't want you to meditate. You might have a glorious revelation. Right. You might experience something that you've longed to experience all of your life if you turn within. And then verse 6 goes on of, of uh, Matthew 15 and says, You have made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Yeah. yeah, by your tradition you've made the word of God. So that's how you take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The name of our God is I am. It's me. We found out in Exodus 20 and verse 3. And when you strip away the value of that, then you're going to tell people, don't turn within. Yeah. Listen to your pastor. Yeah. Listen to the priest. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -oh. Listen to whoever. But don't ever turn within. See, and this is what happens. You know, this is what I was telling Candy on the way down. That's why Jeremiah talked about the yeah. pastors. You know, they feed themselves. They won't yeah. feed, feed the people. Why? They want to keep them under their thumb. That's right. Because they know if they give them back their life, they're yeah. no longer going to need them. That's right. Hello? They're no longer going to need them because they have them under control. They get money. They get numbers. They get all of this stuff. Yes. Now, I'm not saying, thank God that's changing. I'm so glad that's beginning to change yes, out there yes. because people, there's a, an awakening that is taking place in the midst of small groups all over this planet and some larger groups as well. There's an awakening begin to, yes, beginning to take place. So that's taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain is by telling people, you know, don't turn within. So you're taking away the value of the I amness. See, and of the me-ness, the is-ness, the now-ness of turning within. Now, go back to Exodus 20 and verse 8, and let's, let's look at one more here, and we'll probably close with this one. And then uh, <coughs> we'll pick up later and talk about honoring your father and your mother. Uh-oh. What, what if you had parents like Bonnie and Clyde? Could you honor them? What if you were abused by your parents all of your life? Could you honor them? No. Well, obviously it's not talking about your mom and pop. Jesus said, you know, call no man on earth your father. You have one. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. right? So it has to mean something other than your literal, physical, biological mother and father. Yeah. Talking about your mind and spirit, if you want to know the truth. But <laughs> see, I, I already blew that message. <laughs> it's talking about your mind, the mind of Christ, and spirit. Because spirit really is feminine. Even though it says he, when he, the spirit of truth comes, he'll lead and guide you in all truth. It, it's really, it uses the pronoun he, but it's, it's really she. And we'll talk about that when we get to that. But look, look at Exodus 20 and verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. Oh, listen. Oh, the Sabbath day has to be the day of rest. Can I tell you it's not? Now, we've heard that. We've heard that for many years, that the Sabbath, you know, Jesus is the Sabbath and Sabbath is rest. No, it's not. Now I got you thinking. The result is rest. 
The result is rest. But listen to this. Let me read it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Verse 9. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son, nor thy daughter, nor thy man, man servant, nor thy maid servant, nor thy cattle, nor the stranger that's within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. Now, one of the meanings, listen to this, one of the meanings of the number seven, we know it's completion, we know it's fulfillment, we know it's fullness, but another meaning in mystical language of the Sabbath is just the number seven. Now listen to this very carefully. Twelve is associated with the day, because remember there was one place that Jesus said, you have twelve hours a day to do your work. Remember that? I should have looked it up and given, given it to you, but I didn't. So, so day, where it talks about the Sabbath day, day means the perfection of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. And then if you keep holy the seventh, okay, if you keep holy the seventh, the Sabbath, then you are going to experience the perfection of twelve or of enlightenment. Because day speaks of light, night speaks of darkness, but day speaks of light. So when it's talking about the seventh day, or the Sabbath day, it is talking about number seven, the perfection of enlightenment, and 12 is also talking about the perfection of enlightenment. So completion, number seven, is completion. Number seven is the Sabbath, like the end of the week. Seven is Sabbath, but 12, where he said 12 days, or 12, you have 12 hours a day to work, and work while it's light, the night comes when no man can work, day just simply points to the perfection of enlightenment. So what is he saying there? He's saying that we need to honor and we need to hallow the day, or we need to hallow the enlightenment that we receive, because that's what day represents, the perfection of enlightenment, we need to hallow, that's what it says there. Let me go back and read it again. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So to remember would mean what? We need to realize and never forget the fact that the Sabbath is a time of enlightenment that then leads you to experience the rest. See, we've had it backwards. We just, you know, glibly said, well, you know, the Sabbath day is just a day of rest. It's talking about rest in Christ and all that. Yes, that's... But that's just the result of the day of enlightenment or the enlightenment that comes to us by the Spirit. Now, what, is, what did Jesus say in Matthew 6, 22? When your eye is single, your whole body will be filled with light. Enlightenment, you see. And so we can look at that on different levels. What happens when we're involved in that? What happens when we hallow the enlightenment that comes from within us? Well, it happens on two different levels. It happens in our awareness, understanding, and light comes. We awaken, but it also simultaneously happens within our physical body. Yes. Because nothing can happen in your awareness that does not simultaneously happen in your physical body. So what happens is the light the energy that's in the solar plexus in the lower part of our anatomy begins to release that energy up through the seven energy fields of the body, coming to the base of the brain, throwing open the right hemisphere, causing the oil that's in the pineal gland, which is a milky-looking substance, to flow to the pituitary gland that changes to a goldish color, and there you begin to experience the land flowing with milk and honey through the enlightenment, through honoring the Sabbath, or honoring the enlightenment that comes from within you, it will not only change you, as I said, in your awareness, but it will change you in your physical body. You will begin to experience the immortal gene that scientists say we all have. You'll cause that to be quickened. You'll cause that to come alive through the enlightenment, through the, the singleness. If your eye be single, your whole body is going to experience the light. 
No wonder the melatonin at night when you go to bed. No wonder when you go to bed meditating and having your thoughts upon Christ and upon his goodness and his awesomeness and how much he loves you. No, no wonder when the melatonin begins to be secreted from the pineal gland, it says that it kills cancer cells and it lightens the skin. Why wouldn't it lighten the skin? Because when your eye is single, your whole body is filled with light. Of course it's going to lighten the skin. Of course it's going to kill cancer cells. Of course it's going to balance out the circadian rhythm if you have a problem. Of course it's going to take care of blockages in the heart. Of course it's going to do all of those wonderful medicinal things in your body. Yeah. Well, let me dance a little bit while you let this sink in. See, that's the good. Now what is that? That is, as we just read back here in Exodus 20 verse 8, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Keep holy. Keep first and foremost in your heart the fact that we're living in an hour, a Kairos time, when people are waking up all over this planet because they're learning to not judge things from the left hemisphere right. by the seeing of the eye and the hearing of the ear, but they are learning to see things by the single eye, and they're thinking out of the Christ mind. Yes. They've discovered that I am, that me on the inside of them, They've discovered that, and it's working mightily within them. Okay. That's the good news. Now look at Revelation chapter, I'm trying to come for a landing, but look at Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. Look what it says here concerning John, who penned the book of Revelation. He was on the Isle of Patmos, meaning my death. My death. Revelation 1.10, I was in the spirit on, look, the Lord's day. In other words, I was at a point of enlightenment. He wasn't talking about I was in the Lord's day and it was Sunday or Saturday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. Well, I mean, not a 24-hour space day. It's not that at all. He said I was in a place of enlightenment. See, it's not a particular day, you see. He was at a point of of enlightenment. You know, there's one place that says that the Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. I think in Galatians or somewhere. In other words, you know, and we have people today, the Seventh-day Adventists, that say it is Saturday. You've got to worship on Saturday. If you go to services and gather together on Sunday, you're committing sin. Because they look at a certain day of the week, just like the Jewish people did, as, as their Sabbath. But listen, Sabbath is enlightenment. The enlightenment will bring you into rest. Listen, not only a rest in your emotions here, not only a rest from this left side and what it represents, but a rest even in your physical body. Yes. Because if the light is flowing yes. simultaneously yes. in the awareness, it's going to simultaneously flow in the body, yes. and you're going to have energy and energy to spare. Yes. And it's going to be God energy. Yes. It's not going to be an energy that's here today and gone tomorrow. See, and that's the energy we want. We want the energy. We want the strength see, of the Lord to flow through us to the point to where every cell and atom and molecule and proton, neutron, and electron is lit up within us. See? And all of that's already in our body. See? And the key is turning within. Don't take away the key of knowledge from yourself or anyone else. Don't hinder someone else that's trying to turn within. That's what the lawyers did. They took away the key of knowledge by not allowing people, not turning in within themselves, but then trying to take it away from those, hindering those that tried to enter into it. Now, go back to Exodus 20. Exodus 20, 8 through 11. And let's look at this allegorically here. 8 through 11, Exodus 20. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And remember, day is not a 24-hour time-space day, but day is enlightenment. The day is when it's light out. So it, it equals enlightenment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant or thy maidservant, nor thy cattle nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and, sea, and the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. So what is that telling us? 
when it comes to the Sabbath, it's blessed by the Lord. Having enlightenment is blessed of the Lord. Yeah. So we need to what? Give power to that, hallow it, make it a special priority in our life to think out of what the right hemisphere represents. See, to turn within and be enlightened, we need to make that a priority. And as we make that enlightened, that perfect, remember it means, 12 means perfect enlightenment. When we make that 12 or that perfect enlightenment a priority within our life, that's when we're hallowing the Sabbath day that God has blessed. And it will bring you into the Sabbath rest. You will experience that rest. Listen, the word hallowed means, the word hallowed means to consecrate and to set aside, listen, for a special purpose. And so we should set aside, we should honor, and we should hallow the fact that enlightenment, all the light is within us. It's already there. How do we bring it up to our awareness? See, con people need to understand, spirit and consciousness are one and the same. God is consciousness. See, the consciousness of God abides deep within us. But now we want to bring that consciousness of God up to our awareness. Wow. And how is that going to happen? We want to bring it to our conscious awareness here. How is that going to happen? That's going to happen as you, you want to call it meditation? You want to call it chewing the cud, as it means in Hebrew? You want to call it pondering? Pondering on the truth, right? And as you do that, what are you doing? You're slipping into the Christ mind. You're exercising the single eye. All you're experiencing, you're hallowing the Sabbath day. You're making enlightenment your top priority. And the result is then you will be brought into the Sabbath rest. You'll experience that rest. Now, there's another word that's Sabaoth, which means almighty. It means the God of the unseen armies referring to the invisible realm. Jehovah Sabaoth, it talks about, you, you know, known songs, Jehovah Sabaoth and so forth. And that's talking about, it's referring to the Lord of the Sabaoth, which is connected to what we've said so far and the result being the rest that we experience in him. So, in closing, you want to rest from disease, you want to rest from doubt, you want to rest from condemnation, you want to rest from all of those things that you see out here in the external world. Make the Sabbath your priority, the Sabbath day your priority. Be enlightened. And once you are enlightened, you won't be worried about how bad the government is and how bad the president is and how bad situations are out there. You will be a part of fixing that. See, because when you get that perfect enlightenment and you enter into rest, you begin to see the whole earth full of the glory of God, regardless of what's happening out here. You begin to see your family full of the glory of God, experiencing the oneness, the righteousness, the holiness, all that they've always been from before time ever began. They'll experience that. Rather than fretting over all of these things, because I know it appears to be bad out there. It appears horribly bad out there. But the only way we're going to have rest is when we hallow and when we honor the enlightenment that's already within us. And we can bring it up through the meditation, through the single eye, through slipping into that mind of Christ, operating in the mind of Christ. We bring it from the consciousness which is God in the very depth of our being, and we bring it up to our awareness. Mm -hmm. And when we bring it up to our awareness, more light will come. Wow. We'll be enlightened day after day after day after day, and we'll rest from all of those things that appear to be going on out there in the negative world. And we will be a part, not of the problem, we'll be a part of the restoration yeah. as we can gather our vibrational, the corporate vibrational essence of the Father, the I am, the me, the, as we can think from that mind of Christ and exercise the single eye, we are gathering at least, and it doesn't take very many, there can be, listen, a critical mass means that there, there only has to be a few here, a few there, and a few over here. Just a few. <coughs> See, if, if there can just be a few that are going to.
to gather the vibrational corporate single eye seeing, then things can, things can, uh, let me say it this way, not so much change out there, but be the way God created Amen. the earth yes. to be. Yes. See, listen, it's not the earth that needs to change, it's man that needs to change. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the earth is full of the glory of God. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. So already the world. So we're not trying to change the external out there, but what we're trying to do and, and what we are doing is we are seeing it already whole. The way God sees it whole, Amen. see? Amen. And it's just man's mind that needs to change so that we quit sending out all of these negative vibrational, universal vibrational thoughts that are destructive and tear down rather than build up. And don't we want our kids and our grandkids and our great-grandkids to experience the truth? Absolutely, we want them to. So we need to break the cycle. It needs to stop right here and now. We need to break that cycle of all of the religious teaching and garbage that we all have embraced. And listen, folks, we have, we have been given options. We've been given options. We don't have to send out the negative vibration right. stuff out there. We've been given an option. Why? We have dominion. We rule in this life, the scripture says, in this world by the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. That's what it says in Romans. We rule. We rule. It's not God who's sovereign. We rule. And unless we change it, ain't going to be changed. And what I mean by change, unless we can see it already done and completed, see, nothing is going to take place. Nothing is really going to happen. You see? So, you know what? Someone said, oh, that's a big burden to be you know, putting on us. No, it's easy. It's rest. It's really rest if we can do it from the inside out. If you're trying to do it from the outside in, oh, you're going to be having a nervous breakdown. <laughs> but if we can do it from the inside out, it's easy peasy. You know, because you're just in the spirit and it's just, you know. And listen, it's, it's not lackadaisical. Rest doesn't mean that you're not doing anything. See, Jesus always operated from the posture of rest, and he had so much to do, he probably, you know. Had to what? Go to the mountain. Go to the mountain at times, yes. He had a lot to do from rest. See, but he didn't sweat about it. He'd walk up to someone that was cold dead and say, oh, they're just asleep. <laughs> That's all, they're just sleeping. <laughs> Why? He didn't give any power to death. He was in rest. He knew that it was already defeated. Now, Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, what did he do? The death exposed the lies. Because remember what he said, Father, forgive them. They killed him. Societal death. Father, forgive them. What was he doing? He was exposing the lie because later on it says, had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So he was exposing that lie of, of the fact that, you know, mankind killed him. He was, he was exposing the lies of religion that got him killed. And in his resurrection, he revealed the truth of our origin. He revealed the truth of what has always been true about us. You see, that's what happened in the resurrection. But listen, he didn't, even though it uses the word make, he didn't make us righteous in his resurrection. He made this righteous. He made this see righteousness. See, because that's what it says in the scripture. You can find scripture where it says in his resurrection he made us, you know, the righteous. He made us that here. We always were. See? And once we see that, that he revealed something that was always true about us. See? Because what does Colossians 1.21 say? We were alienated or we thought we were separate. And we were enemies or sinners where? In our mind. By wicked works, by work, toil, and sweat is what wicked works means there. By work, toil, and sweat. He came to reveal the truth when we thought the very opposite. He came to reveal the truth of who we had always been. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So, Father, we thank you tonight. Yes. Thank you for your presence. Yes. Thank you for your word. Yes. Thank you that that word, as we turn within, we're embracing the key of knowledge. And as we turn within, and as, as, we, as we begin to just look at the scriptures out 
allegorically and parabolically and spiritually rather than literally. We will experience that awakening and that enlightenment which will bring us into the experience of your rest. Yes. In every area of our life, we thank you. We trust the spirit, our spirit within us, to quicken and make alive the truth that has always been there and wake up that gene of immortality. We thank you. We praise you. We honor you in the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. amen.